Today we're in chapter 34 here in the book of Ezekiel, and we're going to be looking only at the first 10 verses today. This is a very, very rich passage of Scripture, and, and rather than just hurrying and proceeding through, I really wanted to lay a strong foundation. And so in doing so, we'll be looking at just the first 10 verses this time, and then the next time we open the book to Ezekiel, we'll be uh, continuing and concluding chapter 34. So let's begin here in Ezekiel chapter 34 at verse 1. I'll read verses 1 through 6, and we'll get into our study. Ezekiel chapter 34, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 6. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who are sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost. But with force and cruelty you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. They became food for all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and on every high hill. Yes, my flock was scattered over the whole face of the earth, and no one was seeking or searching for them. Now, as we begin chapter 34 here, the date of this particular prophecy obviously is not noted This would have come, though, after the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. What you have here in chapter 34 is a rebuke. It's a rebuke against the false shepherds of the nation of Israel because these false prophets, especially those who were in Jerusalem, had been giving a false hope to the people in that city. Now, Jeremiah, who prophesied in a similar time as Ezekiel, had said in chapter 6 of Jeremiah, verses 13 and 14, He writes, God said, from the least of them even to the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. And from the prophet, even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. They have also healed the hurt of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. And so these false prophets have been preaching a message that things were fine, things were going to be even better, that there was going to be peace. But they were false prophets. They were speaking in a a way that really was really revealing, and you'll see this in some detail in just a moment, the covetousness of their own hearts. They did this for false reasons because they expected to make a profit from it. So in spite of the encouraging words of these false prophets, God had fulfilled His word that the city of Jerusalem would be judged. Their prophets had lied to them, and they had lied in the name of God. And these lies that they had given to the people had brought about a false hope. And as a result of that, their hopes were dashed. Ezekiel in chapter 13, verse 6, had said, The false prophets have envisioned futility and false divination, saying, Thus says the Lord. But the Lord has not sent them, yet they hope that the word may be confirmed. I haven't sent them, yet they have run. I haven't given them a message, yet they have spoken. God has stated, Listen, You're claiming that there's going to be peace. You're saying that things are going to be fine. But there is no peace. I'm bringing judgment against the the city of Jerusalem. It's going to happen. And so Jerusalem had fallen. The Babylonians had taken it. Ezekiel had received word that Jerusalem was captured and and, uh, he spoke and and now it's time for him to once again speak against, against Israel because even remember with me in chapter 33 how it had said it came to pass in the 12th year of our captivity in verse 21 in the 10th month on the 5th day of the month that one who had escaped from Jerusalem came to me and said the city has been captured. And so now God gives him the ability once again or permission to the the unction to to begin to speak now specifically once again to the Jewish nation. And as he's doing so, he begins to speak to them concerning their way of life. And remember last time that we were together, he had stated to them that you come and you sit before me as if you are my people. You act very pious. You act very holy. You act as if you're interested. You sit and you listen. 
You don't get up and move. You don't stir. You listen to the whole message. You even go out and invite people to come and listen. And you say, come in here what the man of God has to say. You come and you sit before me as if you're my people, but in reality, you're not my people. Why? Because you hear, but you will not do. And so Ezekiel had been speaking a very severe word of judgment to these people, and he spoke to them and said, listen, it's not enough that you listen. It's that you have to listen and obey. It's that you have to take what God is saying and put it into practice or else your life won't be transformed at all. You're not really accepting the things that God has to say because you listen to what I say. You even say that I, I'm kind of like a, a, a professional musician, got a good, good voice. I play well on an instrument. You enjoy it. It's entertaining. But you don't take it to heart. These things will take place. These things will come to pass. And then you will know that there has been a true prophet amongst you. And so God is once again speaking a word, a word of judgment. And so he's speaking to the nation of Israel but in chapter 34, he specifically is speaking to the false shepherds, the false shepherds of the nation. Now, notice with me, he says in verse 2 of Ezekiel chapter 34, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy, say to them, thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves, should not the shepherds feed the flocks. The shepherd, the duty of a shepherd is being spoken of here. The duty of a shepherd is to provide for, to care for, to protect the sheep. The shepherds there are there to feed the people. And in a spiritual sense, the, the spiritual shepherds are to, to make provision for, for the people of God by feeding them a proper diet of the Word of God. They're supposed to be speaking forth God's mind to the people. And and when they declare God's mind to them and, and teach them the way of the Lord, it, it is to protect them, it's to bless them, it's so that their, their lives are, are moved, are touched, are used by God. And that's what the shepherds were intended to do. Now, when God was speaking through Jeremiah in chapter 3, verse 15 of his book, the prophet Jeremiah writes in Jeremiah 3, 15, I will give you shepherds according to my heart, who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. The shepherds are not only delivering knowledge and understanding to the people in terms of communicating God's Word, but the shepherds themselves are to have knowledge and understanding of the things of God. There are many people who can speak in the name of God who don't even have an understanding of the ways of God themselves. There are people who can actually give a gospel message by simply memorizing somebody else's words and can masterfully speak it, eloquently speak it. But that doesn't mean that they know the Lord. There are people who know how to communicate things of God, and they can do so well, but they don't have a relationship with God at all. I remember hearing of a man who was a pastor who had been in a pulpit, occupying a pulpit as a pastor for over 40 years. And on one occasion, he was heard to say, I've been preaching the gospel for 40 years, but only recently did I give my heart to Jesus Christ. 40 years of standing up like I am right now. 40 years of declaring the message of the gospel. 40 years of being called pastor. And then he says, and I didn't even have a relationship with God. So it's not difficult to stand up and give a message that is proper it's not difficult to be able to read somebody else's words and repeat them or to hear somebody else's testimony and use it. It's not difficult to do that. But God said, listen, I'm going to give you pastors according to my heart, shepherds according to my heart. They're going to feed you with knowledge and understanding. Not just the words that they speak, but they're going to have a personal understanding. They're going to receive, and that which they have received, they're going to deliver unto you. And so the shepherds were to have knowledge and understanding, and, and they were to feed the people in that manner. But Israel's shepherds had failed to care for the sheep because Israel's shepherds were filled with selfish interests. And they neglected the sheep. And they left them to care for themselves. As we look at this, I want you to note with me that they fed themselves and they clothed themselves while simultaneously neglecting the sheep. In other words... They were doing things that enabled them 
to be able to receive compensation, but they were doing those things and receiving compensation with the wrong attitude and the wrong heart. I, I, I need to, to point out very quickly, and I want you to see this again in verse 2, and it says, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves, should, the, should not the shepherds feed the flock. Well, it, it's not that it was wrong that they should feed themselves. That wasn't the problem. God's Word made provision for them to, to be provided for. It, it, Paul makes reference to this in, in 1 Corinthians in the New Testament in chapter 9, verse 7. He said, who at any time serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat the fruit of it? Or who tends a flock and does not use the milk of the flock? He says in the same chapter, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 14, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. So it wasn't wrong that they were actually being provided for. What was wrong is they were enriching themselves at the people's expense. They were using the people to become rich. Now, I recently received a letter, and uh, I thought it was interesting enough to read to you and, uh, and, and uh, to give you my response because I received letters uh, through our, um, our webpage and all. I, I, I say, if you want to ever ask a question or whatever, just write a letter and I'll get back to you. And so people do, and I have... I have a lot of fun uh, answering questions that people have, and they write, and, and it, it gives me a lot, of, a lot of time to think and all. And one of the letters that I got, um, I got just yesterday, I read just yesterday, and, and I'm going to read you the letter, and I'm going to read my response. And this is all in context of stating that God is saying that these are people who are enriching themselves at the expense of others, but he is not saying that it was wrong for them to do that. But there has to be proper motives in all of this. And so with that in mind, this is a letter, and I'll read it as it came to me. Hello, I listen almost daily, and today you mentioned a new pastor who said, don't give me a salary, instead 10% of the tithe. You called him a hireling. Why can't a pastor negotiate his salary, which is what I see this as? Aren't pastors allowed to make money? I've been to some big churches where in the staff parking lot, there's nothing but expensive vehicles. You know these people are making a large amount of money. The same pastor at this big church talks about his Harley and other toys. He must earn it. He's a good pastor. If I'm a pastor with a small congregation and get 10% of the tithe, I'm sure it's a whole lot less than what this other pastor makes. Isn't a man worth his salt? That's a good question. Isn't a man worth his salt? And so my answer was this, good question. Ask somebody else. No, I didn't say that. I'm riding my Harley. No, good question. <laughs> Paul makes it clear that pastors are to be compensated. 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 1 through 14. Jesus said that a workman is worthy of his hire. Luke chapter 10, verse 7. The problem with it is that a man's value in the kingdom of God is not the same as a man holding a job as a truck driver, lawyer, or any other field. Our work is spiritual. Therefore, we are to trust the Lord to move on the hearts of those who support our ministry. Jesus said, freely you have received, freely give, Matthew 10, verse 8. If I barter my position by pointing to my own accomplishments, I end up merchandising myself based on my own performance and will ultimately cease being a servant to the body, but will become an employee of the church. Think about it. If I tell the people that I will take 10% of the offering as my salary, what starts small could very well grow large. But is it a healthy place when what I am doing is working to produce more people so I can make more money? As for the pastor with the Harley, I hope he enjoys it. I have many friends in the ministry who have nice homes, etc., and do not find fault with that. What I was speaking about is negotiating for money, which dishonors the service to the Lord and makes ministry into a business. What had happened here is these false shepherds had made service into a business, and they were making sure that they had a large 
large portion of the profit. And God's problem isn't that, that the ministers and the old as well as the new were compensated. God's problem was the motives of these people and the fact that they were ripping off the sheep. These men were what are called hirelings. They were neglecting their duties. They were harming the people. And so God has a problem with that. In verse 3, you eat the fat, clothe yourselves with the wool, slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who are sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost. But with force and cruelty, you've ruled them. They were scattered because there was no shepherd. They became food for all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and on every high hill. Yes, my flock was scattered over the whole face of the earth and no one was seeking or searching for them. The heart of God is revealed here. It's a beautiful portion of Scripture. You haven't strengthened. You haven't healed. Notice what he's speaking about here. When he's speaking of these people, and I want you to see the way they're described. I want you to see that they are sick. They are broken. They've been driven away. They've been lost. They're scattered. When you see these people, what you have is, is what normally makes up a congregation of a church. This describes the people that come to Christ. This describes the people who make up congregations of many churches. Because many of the people who come to church, churches like this and this church itself, Many of the people who are here are, are, are fitting into those kinds of conditions. And people who fit into those kinds of conditions are seldom welcomed. They're not the kinds of people that you want to be around normally. They're the ones who don't fit in. They're the ones who are often neglected. They're the ones who are often rejected. These are the ones who can't function socially. They're inept. These are the ones who make people uncomfortable to be around them. These are the ones that God has has sought out that the church has a tendency of of rejecting. Churches are are hospitals. We need to remember that. I, I say this often enough, but it's true. Churches are hospitals, not private members only resorts. And sometimes we look at at churches as if they're to be the cool club where all the cool people hang out and all the cool people hang with the other cool people. And that's just not the way the church is. That's not how it was designed. That's not what it is at all. It's a hospital. If you look around here, there are broken people everywhere. If you look around here, that's what got us saved in the first place, was we were broken people. This is one of those... This is one of those passages in Scripture that speaks to me deeply. There will be emotion. There will be emotion. I look around this congregation and many took their baths and combed their hair and put on their clothes, dressed nicely, came to church and are broken, broken people, broken. And there are so many in this world that are so torn up, so in pain. And sometimes, and I'm going to be open with you and I hope this makes sense. Some of you will understand, others may not. But I, as a pastor, sometimes see, not just in this fellowship, but I see so many broken people, so many fragmented human beings, so many torn up people, and I, and sometimes it just, sometimes it tears me up in a way that I can't put into words. I was on a subway in New York City two days ago. And 
directly next to me is a man who's overweight, beard down to his chest, hair is disheveled, wearing some raggedy old clothes. And as I'm standing next to him, he's on the subway, out of nowhere he just begins to sing at the top of his lungs, making up words to songs. And I'm standing there and he's right next to me. And I stepped away and I looked in his direction. And my friends, my wife were with me. All of us felt the same uncomfortable feeling. And the people in the subway are all kind of like smiling and nodding, that knowing kind of look. Like we got another crazy on the subway. I was uncomfortable, helpless. I was thinking, God, what can I do? What can I do for him? What a broken little life he has. What a lonely, lonely man he must be. God, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I, I felt hopeless. I felt helpless. I felt, Lord, I feel that quite often. When I see that this nation is influenced by very few voices, you know, you can, you can go to Dallas and you can go to Denver. You can go to Fort Lauderdale. You can go to Hollywood. You can go to New York City, Los Angeles, San Francisco, San Diego, anything in between. And everybody knows Katie Couric. Everybody will recognize her when she's walking down the street. We were walking by Central Park and Larry King comes walking past us. Everybody recognizes him. I was on a plane the other day and Willie Nelson comes walking by. Everybody recognizes him. Millions and millions and millions of people recognize only few people. Think about it. There are few voices that influence millions of people. Millions. When you're in New York City and you're walking down crowded streets and you know that 99.9% .9 of those people walking down that street would recognize some of those names that I just mentioned instantly, it tells you how so few people influence so many. So few. And it can make you as a Christian feel, Lord, indeed, like John was called a voice crying in the wilderness, that's what we are, crying in the wilderness. And people ignore that message. For me, ministry is a very personal thing. And I see these people here in, in Ezekiel 34 as, as those whom God loves and those, those whom God reaches. And, and you see the anger in the heart of God. You see the, the passion in God when he says, I'm going to bring judgment on them, those shepherds, because God loves his sheep. And there are so many people who are are the off-scouring. They're not cool. They don't have the money to buy the cool clothes. They can't afford to go and have their hair cut in a certain place, and they can't put on all those neat things that the others have. They don't have the huge TV sets, and they don't drive the cool cars, and they're not the ones who people gravitate to. I understand that. When my wife Marie and I were dating and I was wanting her to get to know who 
this guy is that she was with. I asked her this. I said, Marie, when you were a little girl and you were in elementary school, do you remember the little boy or the little girl at lunchtime who sat by themselves and all the other kids played? Do you remember them? Did you have somebody like that in your life that you remember the little guy who would sit there by himself eating his lunch? She goes, I, I, ah, there were kids like that in my school. I said, that was me. That was me. I was the little boy who sat and ate his lunch by himself. I was the little boy that didn't have a lot of friends. That was me. I said, you want to know who you're dating? That's who you're dating. I have something in my heart for broken people. I understand them. Been there. Understand it. And I understand something of the love of God for them because of the broken ones. The ones that nobody wants. The ones that feel that nobody cares. And there's a passion in the heart of God for those and an anger in his heart towards the shepherds who neglected them. And God begins to speak of them. You see, in 1 Corinthians in chapter 1, verses 26 through 29, Paul said, Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things, the things that are not, to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. God takes the weak and makes them strong. He takes those with no value and he gives them value. That's what he does. So God is speaking to the shepherds of Israel and he says to them, the weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who were sick. When he speaks of the weak and those who needed healing, He's saying that these are people weak and in need of healing because they haven't been fed properly. They're spiritually weak and they're spiritually sick. And they remain that way because you didn't give them something that could have rescued them. You didn't give them something that could have healed them. You didn't give them God's word. You see, in Psalm 107 verse 20, the word says that he sent forth his word and healed them. He rescued them from the grave. You see, a true shepherd is concerned with the spiritual feeding of the sheep. A false shepherd will say anything that tickles the ear and gets a crowd. A false shepherd will do anything to keep the pews filled with people and the nickels and noses there. That's what false shepherds do. They want to make sure that they meet the budget. They want to make sure that payroll is met. So they'll say whatever is popular, whatever is necessary, whatever happens to be at that moment the common wisdom. They'll say those kinds of things so that people will keep coming, fill those pews and keep on putting money in that money box. But Jesus Christ, Jesus taught us to be true shepherds. It says in, in Mark chapter 6, verse 34, when, when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. You see, that's the heart of every true minister, teaching God's word properly in order to spiritually feed and, and, and to heal those who are spiritually sick. There's only one way you can get well, guys, and that's through the word of God. You're not going to get well through jokes. You're not going to get well through entertainment. You're not going to get well through, through all the, the various things that people are trying to bring about in church today. The way you get well is through the Word of God that transforms human lives. It's by the Word of God that feeds your, your, your soul, that strengthens you from the inside, that, that brings that healing. That's how it happens. And so when Jesus saw these, these great crowds, he taught them the Word of God. And so that's the first thing. The second thing, he says, you haven't bound up the broken. 
Now, these people who are broken, are, are broken, they have pain-filled consciences that, that are in need of cleansing and in need of, of soothing. Some of the sheep have fallen. Some have injured themselves, he's saying, but, but you haven't cared for their wounds. Broken people should have a place where they can come, a place where they're loved. If the church doesn't welcome a broken person, a cult will. I guarantee you. If the church rejects them, a cult will welcome them. I guarantee you. I've said this before. I was in a church service. I was two years old in the Lord at this time. I'd just gotten out of the military, began fellowshipping at a church. During worship, there were only about 20 or 30 of us in a small room. It was a small study. We were singing. We used to sing out of hymnals. And at one point, there's one of those breaks. Then you all start singing at the same time. And there was a guy who was seated next to me, a guy who had just gotten saved, a guy who was a drug user, an abuser, a guy who had... His mind was still foggy from all the drugs he had taken. He had talked to me, and he had shared with me that he was a guy who used to like to take second all, reds. So I don't even know if any people take that anymore. I pray that they don't. But that was one of the drugs of choice when I was a kid. We dropped reds. And so I understood that. I understood what it meant to drop reds. I understood what it meant to get loaded like that. And, and this guy here was a red freak. We used to call him red freaks. But he had gotten saved, and there he was seated next to me, and he was all raggedy and everything, and he still looked like he was just, you know, getting well. And at this point during the singing, there's that stop, and then we're all supposed to sing at the same time. Well, yeah, I guess the spirit was all over him because he sang before everybody else did at the top of his lungs. The only one singing, off tune, I might add. And, of course, there is that laughter and that, that look that people give when somebody makes a fool out of themselves. But I was seated next to him, and it hit me. It hit me, something I've never forgotten. It, it hit me when I realized I am more like you, this red freak. I'm more like you than I am everybody else around me. I'm more like you. I'm messed up too. I'm in need of healing too. I goof up just like you do. I've never forgotten that. And, and I can say this before the Lord and before you, and I still feel that. Still feel that. I'm no better than anybody else. I'm in need of Jesus just as much as everybody else that I minister to. I understand those things. I know what it's like to wake up in your own vomit. I understand that. I know what it's like to wake up wondering how you got here and what did you do last night. I haven't forgotten that. I know what it's like to come from that. And I've remained intentionally, at least in my memory, close to the place I entered in. Not so that I could go back, but so that I wouldn't make judgment on others who are still there or just came out of it. Because I'm no better. And he is saying this, you have not healed the broken, the hurt ones, the ones who come into the churches that really don't have it all down and aren't even trying to pretend that they do. There are so many that pretend that they do. They've got it all down from A to Z. And when they meet me, they got the verses ready to go. And our conversations, they want to tell me about their devotions and tell me what a spiritual person they are. You know, I've been to a lot of places where people don't know me. They know my name. They don't know me. And I'm a guest speaker at a radio rally or some kind of thing. And my last name, I'm a Mexican. And so they already got in their mind, especially when you go off into some, you know, Midwest state, they already picture me in a certain way. So I can walk around there and they don't even know who I am. It's the truth. It's the truth. And I'll walk up and I'll say, They'll say, you know, let's welcome David Rosales. And I'll come walking up and, and I'll say, surprise. <laughs> I say, you were expecting somebody with black hair, somebody with a Zapata mustache, <laughs> bandana maybe, 
overweight, dark complexion. You were thinking, and ugly, you were thinking I was Raw Reese. <laughs> you got us confused. But I'll walk around, and it's weird how they will treat you once they know who you are versus when they didn't know who you were. It's interesting how welcoming they become to me when they know who I am and how they didn't give me a moment before they knew who I was. See, I still go through that to this day. I still go to places they don't know me by face. And I still experience that. And I don't want my church to be that way to anybody, to treat the guest speaker or the pastor better than the person next to them in the pew. Because we're all in it together. We're all together in this. We're all family in the body of Christ. And there's nobody more important than somebody else. And we ought to treat each other with the love and concern that that should be shown to just any member of the body. I believe that, that, that the body of Christ should be a welcoming place. It should be a place where people can come and be healed. But God's saying, you haven't bound up the broken. People are in pain. People are in grief, loss. They, they're, they're, they're going through things like divorces and child custody battles and things of that nature, and they're broken. So they need to have a place where they can come so they can be bound up. It's like that the demon-possessed men in Gadara and how, how it's described, one of them's described as being naked and he cuts himself and he moans, he screams, he's very strong. They bind him with chains and he breaks them. And, and then the Lord Jesus Christ comes and, and ministers to him. And, and, and after Jesus delivers him, it says in Luke 8, 37 through 39, the whole multitude of the surrounding region of the gatherings asked Jesus to depart from them. They were seized with great fear and he got into a boat and returned. Now, the man from whom the demons had departed begged him that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your own house. Tell what great things God has done for you. And he went his way and proclaimed throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. We, we need to be the kinds of people who are welcoming to those who have been broken. You see, true shepherds know and understand that God's word provides relief for those who have been broken. Jesus invited all people to come to himself. He said, you can come and you can be healed of your brokenness. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things, he said, are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I can transform your life, God said. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Jesus said, all that the Father gives me will come to me. Whoever comes to me, I'll never drive away. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. True shepherds understand that God provides for the broken. He says also, you haven't brought back what was driven away. Some had been led into error, but the leadership didn't care because they rejected the truth. All they could give to people was their own idea or their own opinion. But from the beginning, Jesus cared about error and understanding. When Jesus was 12 years old, he went to the temple with Mary and with Joseph. And as Mary and Joseph left, Jesus remained behind. And the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 2, verses 46 through 47, it was after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. Jesus cares about error in understanding, but a false shepherd doesn't care. You see, it's the truth that sets a person free, but the false shepherds don't care as long as they get their paycheck. And then finally he says, nor have you sought what was lost. And the reason they were lost is because no one had guided them to safety. And shepherds are to lead the sheep into a place of safety caring for them. But these false shepherds didn't do so. They didn't care at all. Well, the Bible tells us that the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So what they did is they performed their ministry, if you will, for a paycheck. 
They fleeced people for personal gain. And instead of caring for them gently, they drove them away, and they injured them with force and cruelty. He says in verse 4, The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who were sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost. But with force and cruelty you ruled them. They were scattered because there was no shepherd. They became food for all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and on every high hill. Yes, my flock was scattered over the whole face of the earth. And no one was seeking or searching for them. They were aimless. They were scattered. And they were neglected like the people in our homes, our cities, our states, and our nation. So the Lord speaks, Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, says the Lord God, surely because my flock became a prey and my flock became food for every beast of the field because there was no shepherd. Nor did my shepherds search for the flock, but the shepherds fed themselves and did not feed my flock. Therefore, O shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand. I will cause them to cease feeding the sheep, and the shepherds shall feed themselves no more. For I will deliver my flock from their mouths, that they may no longer be food for them. I'm opposed to them. I will remove them, and I will deliver my flock from them. And ultimately, they will be held responsible for what they have done to my people. Paul said something in 1 Corinthians in chapter 9, verse 16, that has been to me a very important verse for a long time. He said there, Woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. God has called us to be as clear as possible in the things of the Lord. And I believe one of the best ways to be as clear as possible is to go through the whole counsel of God. That's why we take time to go through the Bible verse by verse. I do the best that I can to try and understand and teach the passage that I present to you. Because I believe that that strengthens you. I believe that that's the way that you can be protected from error. That's the best way for us as a fellowship to grow in the ways of the Lord. A, a false shepherd won't do that. A, a false shepherd doesn't care whether they preach the gospel or not. But Paul was not a false shepherd. That's why he said, woe unto me if I don't preach the gospel. You see, Israel had been plagued by false shepherds, but God is making it clear that they're going to have a true one. And the truest shepherd that they'll ever have is Jesus Christ, who is the good shepherd. And it's the Lord Jesus Christ who came. It's the Lord Jesus Christ who spoke. It's the Lord Jesus Christ who ministered, who ultimately gave up his life in order that he might draw people to himself. It's, it's Jesus, the true shepherd, the good shepherd, the one who came that he might give his life for the sheep. And so the Lord is saying, listen, you have had your false shepherds, the ones who don't care, the ones who have used you, the ones who have, have basically made money off of you. They have profited from you. They have lived lives that, that are above the average person and didn't care about your soul, didn't care about your spirit. They didn't care about you at all. He says, I'm going to take care of them. I'm going to deal with these false shepherds. I most certainly will make sure that they receive what is due to them. But ultimately, you need to understand that as I deliver my flock, they will be fed by one who truly does love them. And this true shepherd is Jesus Christ. That's why I gave my heart to the Lord. On um, two Sundays from now, I'll be celebrating my spiritual anniversary. And I have the joy of teaching a Sunday morning on the anniversary of my coming to faith in Jesus Christ. And I can't imagine a greater privilege than the privilege God has given to me to be able to talk about, about Jesus. for 39 years. 20 years old when I gave my heart to the Lord. For 39 years, almost two-thirds of my life, 
been walking with Jesus Christ. And I can stand here today telling you that it hasn't been easy. There have been some very deep, deep, painful times in my life. Things that have hurt worse than anything I've ever experienced. But I wouldn't give up one day walking with the Lord for anything because he has been with me every step of the way. He has never left me, nor has he ever forsaken me. He has always provided for me and has been a friend closer than a brother. And he has forgiven me of all of my sins and has given to me blessings of friendships, of a wife, babies, grandbabies that are so valuable. But beyond that, he's given hope and joy and peace and love and eternity in him. And that's why I thank God for my own Pastor Chuck, who's been my pastor for many, many years, and dear friends who have been there with me through some of the hardest times of my life. But I thank God for Jesus, who said, I will never, never, never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus is the good shepherd. And he loves you. And he protects you. And he walks with you through the valley of the shadow of death. And you're with him. You fear no evil. His rod and his staff, they do comfort you. He prepares a meal before your enemies. The Lord truly is good. And God is simply saying, listen, You've had some false shepherds, but I will be your true shepherd. You can get disappointed in man, and if you put too much faith in me, I will hurt you. But there is one who never will, and that's our true shepherd. That's Jesus. Let's keep our eyes on him.